welcome to HMH Learning Moments, a production of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. I'm Lish Mitchell, and I work at HMH. Today's episode is a new installment of our Teachers in America series, hosted by HMH's Director of Content and Programming, Noelle Morris. Our special guest today is Dr. Chris Emden, an Associate Professor in the Department of Mathematics, Science, and Technology at Columbia University. Chris works to support diverse students in their STEM learning through an understanding of race and culture. He is a director at the Center for Health Equity and Urban Science Education and an associate director at the Institute for Urban and Minority Education at Columbia. He has been a guest and contributor on PBS, TEDx, NBC, and CBS, just to name a few. Chris is the founder of Science Genius and Hip Hop Ed a nonprofit educational organization that boosts student voice by utilizing youth culture. His articles can be found in The Atlantic, and he is author of the New York Times bestseller, White Folks Who Teach in the Hood, and the rest of y'all too. Noelle's full video interview with Chris, recorded before school closures, is now available on HMH's YouTube channel. Now, here's Chris and Noelle. Chris. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you for joining our Teachers in America podcast. I'm psyched um, to be here. Thanks H-H. for having me. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're psyched because I I don't know. I held my um, composure um, because when we first approached you and talked to you, like, I think you realize now that I could talk to you every day. It's all good. Like, I mean, it's, as soon as we met a year ago, I was like, we're fast friends. Synergy. <laughs> Synergy. Yes. Um, diff- you know, different generations, but definitely on the same wavelength. So the first thing I want to just come right out and ask you to define and share with us is your um, ratchedemia. Like, explain that to me and explain how you came up with that concept and how how do you share that with other teachers? Yeah, you know, uh, ratchedemic or ratchedemia or being ratchedemic is a thing. I don't even think I came up with it. I think it just sort of evolved. I mean, the concept of being ratchet has existed forever. Um, a lot of Southern hip hop used the phrase ratchet to describe people who are kind of like lowbrow and kind of like raw and just like, a, you know, overtly performative as being ratchet. Um, I go even further than that. My, my first relationship with the word ratchet was like, you know, mid eight, mid 80s, late, like well, yeah, early 90s. It was a negative growing up. Yeah. Like you were called ratchet. It's not a beneficial thing. Mm-hmm. And in, in 90s Brooklyn, being a ratchet was like a weapon. Like, I was like a gun, right? So so ratchet has ho- always had these negative connotations. Whether you're talking about, like, you know, in the 70s, there was, like, a character called Nurse Ratchet, who was, like, this evil, mean woman nurse, which I came to discover. And then, like, in 90s Brooklyn, the ratchet is like a gun. It's, like, violent and negative. And then, like, 80s, I mean, 90s and 2000s, like, Southern hip-hop, ratchet is, like, all negative. So something that's always had a negative connotation, but I think is not inherently negative. Because sometimes people who are loud, abrasive, um, they, they, people think like, like, you know, like you're so aggressive, it's like a weapon. You know, those are just expressions of love and a, a charisma and personality. And being academic is seen as the opposite. You and I talked about yeah. it, though, though too, because I see it as allowing myself to be in my raw space yes. without being over forced into conformity. I, that, that, well, you've said it, you asked me the question, that was the answer. Like, that you can be raw, real, authentic, even if it's viewed in a negative way, but it's who you authentically are, and concurrently be smart and intelligent and brilliant, and that you don't have to perform brilliance. You know how people like perform brilliance? Mm-hmm. Like they act like they're smart, but they're like boring, and, but you're just boring, not smart. You know, like, it's understanding it's like that you like any lecture hall right. where you're just like, I'm going to tell you what you need to no, know, no. and that's all you need all right, to class, know. All right, class, sit down. <laughs> Here's the information. Soak it in. If you want to answer a question, please raise your hand. Like that, or that's, go to the parking lot. Like I, I have I never can, handled a parking lot. I have parking lot issues. Like I have like parking lot trauma, right? It's like, because parking lot is like, go away and don't be engaged and don't bring who you are. And if I think about that question after I finish what I want to say, then I'll come back. back. And then by the time you come back, you've forgotten it. Yeah. And sometimes the beauty of like being academic is being in the moment and sharing what you have to offer. So anyway, rationalism is just merging those worlds. So I can be myself and be smart. I can be hood and be intelligent. I can be loud and abrasive and I can still be genius. And that we can have identities that bring all of it together. And that when young people understand that being smart is not performing smartness, mm-hmm. the world opens up. 
right? They see like, oh my gosh, I could be more than just some version of me. And so I actually have a book coming out and the title is Ratchademic, Reimagining Academic Genius. Like, like you know, you know, acad reimagining academic excellence. Like excellence does not have to look a certain way. Being academic is not, is not a performance and being ratchademic is an identity. And I want all young folks to be ratchademic because I want them all to know and love who they are and still have high intellect and high value for things that are, you know, about pursuing knowledge. So I want to talk about that too on the side of being a teacher yeah and being a white teacher being a teacher of color yeah because there's a couple of things I've always said y'all mm -hmm. and when I tried to take that out of my vocabulary even as an English language arts teacher yep. I was losing myself mm -hmm. I was like what am I doing and I'm not gonna be like y'all we're talking about Romeo and Juliet mm -hmm. and then every time I'm but my students started realizing, like, Miss Morris, you're, why are you saying so many words mm -hmm. to get to the one part? And I find that with teachers of color, and I want you to talk me through this and help me learn too, yeah. in the ability to code switch. Well, you know, look, the, the bottom line is that being a person of color in academic spaces, there's almost a uh, transplanted onto you before you open, open a word is a perception that you're less than or that you don't have a command of the language or that you, you don't know the rules of engagement. And so there's, there's more of a need to perform intelligence because what your authentic self is, is definitely seen as not intelligent. So like, you know, your use of y'all doesn't mean that you don't understand that it's you all and that you can't, then you can use you all in the appropriate context, but your raw self is y'all. And for folks of color sometimes, it's like, you know, if I say y'all, they're gonna think I'm dumb. All right, you know, if I, if, I, if I speak a certain way, they're gonna misperceive me as not having the credential to be here. So I'm, I have a likelihood to be more performative. Okay. But if I'm more performative, I'm losing my authenticity and then I can't connect as well. So you're stuck in this conundrum, right? If I'm my authentic self, you know, my principal or AP might come in and say, why are you speaking to the kids that way? You know, don't, don't you know subject verb agreement? Like, you know, why aren't you getting this right? So I might be misperceived as not, but, but if I perform something different, the raw self that I am that connects to young folks gets lost. And so you're, you're stuck in a sort of like pedagogical purgatory. Right. right? And I noticed today in the lesson that I got to watch you lead with um, the students and Loaded Lux and all of this, that you're also not afraid of noise, right? So you know, we're, we're talking, you don't have good classroom management if your class is not quiet, if it's not in rows. Now that's not the way we teach in 2020, but Chris, I could hear this class down the hall and not, no one in this hallway yeah. even was bothered. And, and you should. But you yeah. weren't bothered either because to me the noise meant, it was almost like your formative assessment that yes. they're getting it, they're collaborating, they hear each other. And it's, it, I was seeing that it was a student's form of peer feedback. Ain't nothing like good noise in the classroom. Nothing like it. Because if young folks are so enthused and passionate and engaged in what you've taught them, that they want to have discussions about it, and they want to ask questions to you and others about it, then that's magic. Like, that's how I know I did something. If my, I, if my class is too quiet, I question my effectiveness, right? Like, if, it's, if it, they're just passively engaging, I'm, there's no enthusiasm. You know, there's, there's, no, there's no feel. If there's no feel, then I'm not good. It doesn't mean that they can't get the content. They may be able to, but I'm not, I, you, know, I, I've, you know, I may have touched the mind, but I can't get to the soul. You know, when I get to the soul, that's when, I, when it, it comes out viscerally. And I think it's really interesting that you raised that point about, you know, down this hallway, no one complained. We are in the kind of places that folks say they want kids to get to. Like, you know, learn this way so you can make it to an Ivy League institution. We're here at Columbia University. There's noise, baby. Like, we're engaging. We're asking questions. People are walking around the hallways. They, they're spilling in and out of class. That there's a, in, in places where there is an appreciation for high intellect, there's a recognition that high intellect is an exercise that is not limited to the classroom. 
Or an outline. Or not. That's the other thing too, because I, I know as a team, yeah, we, you know, every we we're just like, should we get an outline from Chris? I said, Chris has it in his head. Yeah. We have to sometimes trust. Mm -hmm. Now I know as a teacher, I, Chris, do you know how many times I got in trouble that my lesson plans weren't on time? I get it. it and I would say, I'm gonna, I have it. I know what I'm gonna do, mm. and I've never been able to explain, even to this day, yeah. in the way I work. I know people struggle with my organization yeah. or how I perceive my work. And I'll often hear, I don't know how you do what you do. Mm. I don't know how you stay organized. And my response back is, I don't know how you to don't. tell you necessarily what yeah. I do. I don't, and so I, when I watch you and I've connected with you, there's the same creativity. Yeah. I didn't need to come in here and see a learning outcome on the wall yeah. or target or a standard yeah. to know what you were hitting yeah. and to know that you were planned. So so talk to me in the sense and talk to our listeners in the sense of future educators yeah. and administrators who are meeting creative teachers. It's the distinction between a lesson plan and a lesson script that folks don't tease out. You know. Folks say they want a teacher to give them a lesson plan. That's not what they want. They want a script. They want a play-by-play -play of every moment. But the beauty of teaching and learning is that you should be able to be nimble enough to move at the whim of a student's attention and go where they need to. So for me, I have to have high expectations. I have to have benchmarks I want to meet. And I have to have in my mind what I can get from kids to indicate that I'm meeting where they need to go. But I, if, I, if I confine myself to a script, then I can't be flexible enough to meet my benchmarks. And I think that we have to learn the difference between a script and a plan. Right. Um, you have to plan. To teach well, you have to have a plan. Yeah. So in my, I, in, in my mind and on paper, I have like, this is what I want to get at the end of this. It's more of a sketch, it's right? A sketch. It's not in a framework or it's not in a- Let me get one of these, yo. Like, that's it. Like, I need, you, you, it needs to be a sketch. It needs to be a heuristic. It needs to be a diagram. It needs to be a map. Mm -hmm. But it, it cannot be too detailed. It cannot be too structured. It cannot be, at minute 45, I'll ask the kids this. At minute 47, they should, because in that way, you're asking a question and you have a prescribed answer. And there's no prescribed answers in good learning. I saw this today and I want people as they're listening to this podcast and then they, they go back into some of our YouTube um, videos and see this lesson mm -hmm. that you did. I want to bring people to some attention of watching you in action. Mm. The lesson's phenomenal, right? The student output, the engagement, the collaboration, um, allowing, seeing the connections that can easily be made. There's still a moment of you're an adult, you're a teacher, and they're students. Always. So it's always going to be this dude, mm -hmm. like, it's not. But you are in a moment, and you're with them, and you have, I can see your eyes, like you know where this lesson's gonna go and you want it to go. You are about to make a decision, well, I wanna go this way. And but it was were, your will, and she was she not was gonna else. let you. That's she right. She kept coming back at it. Talk to us as, as future teachers, as teachers, yeah. how, how do you get so comfortable with yourself yeah. that you allowed her to make the decision? You got, teachers have to trust like the students. If, you, if you've earned the respect of the student, even if they're taking you in a different direction, they respect you enough to ensure that they, that they get you right back on course. And they're sharing with you what they need. And you know, for me, it's like, you, I, I always tell my aspiring teachers that I work with, you have to have a freestyle ability, mm -hmm. which is the ability to just be in the moment and trust that you're gonna get to the right spot and you have to be able to freestyle. You have to take, you know, you, all that you get, get melded together to get mm -hmm. this thing. Um, you know, and you look, you know, the best assessments I know are in the eyes of young people. Yep. And when she said, no, I need more time. And she was making eye contact oh, with you and she kept looking down at her work and then she'd be looking like. Looking at me and like, dude, get this right. And <laughs> I had to get it right. And, and I had to trust that she'd get us where we needed to go. And another thing I've learned, you know, as a teacher, the best rule ever is never go one-on-one. -on -one. Yep. Whenever there's a moment where a young person is adamant about something, it doesn't matter if they're right or wrong, in their mind, and their heart, they're invested in this thing, you can't battle a kid one-on-one. -on -one. Cause once you create that confrontation in a one-on-one, -on -one, now you take everybody out of the zone, mm -hmm. out of the element, and then everybody's watching the spectacle. Yep. And they're looking at that spectacle to see who wins. And once you do that, then you, got, you activate this thing I call affiliation and alienation, which is now it's like, I've got to pick a side. Am I going to pick the one person, the, the student, 
or am I going to pick the teacher? And here's the thing, as a teacher, as an adult, they have more social capital with the young people. So chance, nine times out of 10, they're going to pick the young person. Now you're the outsider. And if you're the outsider, then they all can coalesce against you. And then the lesson doesn't get done. So from, in that moment, there were a couple lessons. One, never go one on one. Two, trust the student to get them back, to get, to get, get the lesson back. Three, trust yourself to be able to freestyle yourself back the way you need to go. And then four, like, yo, you know, Joel Embiid says this, like, trust the process. Uh, you know, this whole teaching and learning is a pro and it's a dance more than anything else. You trust your partner, because your partner wants to get you to have the best performance as well. Yeah. But there was a moment, too, where I was watching your proximity, mm -hmm. your proximity to the learners. Yeah. And you weren't afraid to, or you were naturally not afraid, mm -hmm. and that phrase is not the right word, but you naturally are okay if you turn your shoulder and your back to students yeah. who were much engaged with you yep. to turn over here and say, what's coming over here? Yeah. And then as other students would be like, yo, like listen to what I'm doing. Yep. You knew that those students had already known and realized mm. you see them, you hear them, you know yeah. they're, what, that what they're doing is on track. Yeah. But that's part of their personality. And you would give just enough to look over and say, I hear you, but I gotta come over here. As a teacher, people think that your words are your main tool, but as a teacher, your body is your instrument. Like literally, your, the, the physicality of your being. People ask me all the time, like, why well, I'm so concerned with aesthetics, you know, I do the bow ties. and the, Like, why do I have so much attention to detail in my aesthetics? And I, I, it's because as a teacher, like I see you, right? Mm -hmm. Just, no, this is important. You, you have the, the blue and white kind of seersucker vibe with the pink accents. Your watch is blue and pink. Your earrings are pink. The, the, the touch of, of pink in your lipstick. And when you're working with young people, every iota of your body is part of your teaching. So your, your attention to aesthetics has to be off the hill. Because they notice all those things and say, oh my gosh, she cared enough to match her shirt to her watch for me. She cares enough about me. But most importantly, my body is like, that's my weaponry, mm -hmm. right? So a shoulder to a student, not turning your back, but a shoulder to a student says, I'm not focused on you right now, but this is still focused on you. At any second, I can always turn back around and you're with me. So I can't give a kid my back, but I can give my kid my a shoulder. The shoulder says, you're not my main focus, but I'm always ready for you. That's pedagogical. While I'm focusing on this young person, one young person that I might be focusing on, they just need eye contact. They don't need my words, they just need me to look at them. And I could do shoulder to one, eyes to the other, hand on shoulder of the other, all at the same time, and I'm saying three different things to three different young people, and I haven't said any words yet. Now, my voice. My voice could be like, yo, over there, I see y'all. So now I'm communicating with one, two, three, and four at once. And I think teachers have to understand how to feel comfortable in their skin because every, every square inch of your body should be teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and your words are just the, um, you know, they're just the part that is heard. But what your body does is what is felt. And you can't get to that part of full teaching in that way until you're comfortable in your own skin. I would always realize where my teacher blind, where your peripheral, blind. where my blind spots yeah. were, because I would catch myself like, Noelle, you're, you're too much over here. Accidentally, students in this, and I would remember where I'd stand in my room to see where my blind spots yes. were, to see how I could corral or reshape the classroom yeah. to not have as many blind spots. Oh, Noelle, like you, like you get so much of the technical aspect of this craft that I, that I wish more people got, because see, like my one, two, three, and four can easily shift within a millisecond to another one, you know, two, three, and four. And I think it's about the shifting of the body also lets you know that if there's a blind spot in this moment, a millisecond can, can, can connect to another young person. And you're like, I literally, one day I'll do this work, right? I, like there are angles to your body that, that allow you to be able to have a certain presence in the classroom. And if you're not aware of what your body is saying, you, you're, you'll be surprised at what outcomes you're getting, right? So for example, like, well, he's talking about all these angles and backs and shoulders to students, but I've literally done studies where young folks who don't get the right angles respond to my instruction differently. 
Um, and I just need us all to understand the power. Listen, teaching is such magic. It is. I like, you know, I, and, it, and you have, and you, the magic happens so often, and you and I have in this conversation, and I'm sitting here sometimes going, I cannot believe that I got to sit back and watch, you know, Christopher Emden, mm. and then you allow me to say, hey, Chris, when you were doing this, did you know, and you and I are having this conversation, yeah. and it's just a, I see you as my coach, you're letting me coach, yeah. we, are, we are together, we're giving feedback. This is why I'm so open, and you allow me to be so open to ask you questions yeah. where I'm still also, tw 25 years in this, want to learn, want to give. That today, one of the lessons that came out of um, you and Loaded Lux, and, and I want everyone to hear this, because I've been waiting to share my word. You brought up that Loaded Lux had the word healthy on his shirt, and that, yeah. that, that again, is an aesthetic that's purposely, intentionally decided. Yep. And, and he talked about having a word. What is your word? And, mm. um, you know, his was healthy. And then he also said beloved. Yep. And I remember watching some of the rap battles. So when he, today I was sitting back here and I was like, I'm going to tell Loaded Lux that when I was three, five years old, my dad called me Boogie. Mm. Like Boogie was my nickname. Mm. And so uh, he he's listening in and he's leaning in. He's like, you know, tell me more. And I said, and here's why at 50, I know my dad saw I had the ability to get the rhythms, yeah. to hear the sounds, yeah. hear the beats, yeah. connect to the lyrics, yeah. connect to people, connect to what's happening in our society. It's a consciousness that it's you a have. Consciousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To this day that music and hip hop and all that has been a part of my life. So I want to ask you one, what's your what's your word? Yeah. Um, and then I have a couple. we're going to talk about some walk up songs and other things. Yeah, that I got a, you said so much. You said so much beautiful and magical stuff. One of my favorite, favorite thinkers ever is Maxine Green. I love her mm -hmm. like and Maxine always says and she would say to me in this like, you know, in this world, we never arrive. We are always becoming. And when you say like at 25 years, I still want to get better, it's that. You, you, never, you never get to be the perfect teacher. You're always evolving to be a more informed pedagogue, right? You're always adding things. And I think once teachers feel as though now I got it, that's when I know for a fact you don't have it. So that, that you, when you said that, that struck me. Um, and in my word, I have a couple words, man. Like sometimes it's like vision. Um, I want to be able to, you know, I see what's going on in the place, but I also see the emotion. I, want, I see the reactions. I see the, so as a teacher, I want to always activate this like Stevie Wonder-esque inner vision mm -hmm. to be able to like see beyond what folks are giving you to see what's left, what's behind the scenes. Um, so I think vision is a, a good one for me. I think, you know, power, purpose, you know, everything I want to do, everything I do, I, I want to do with purpose and with intention. And then, you know, and there's also an element of what I do, which is odd for me to share on this platform, but it's an element of what I do is like, you know, I'm also like, you know, like hater proof. You know what I mean? <laughs> you gotta be hater proof. If you wanna do any revolutionary work, if you wanna do anything important in the world, you have to recognize that folks are gonna say things about you, people are gonna critique you, people are gonna make things up about like and you have I to I love the hater proof. Oh, like, you gotta I be hater proof. Now, that is gonna be on a t shirt underneath yeah, yeah. what I'm wearing because to me, you are so Calm. It is that is going back to the bat to the rap it's a battle. battle. Yeah. I'm hater proof. I'm hater proof. Come at me. You can whatever. say whatever you want, my G. I'm good. I, I know, know who, I, who am. I am. When I leave here, I'm still good. I'm still doing. Regardless. And and with battle rap is so fascinating. Is I always make the argument that those folks are jousting with words and saying horrific things as a means to prepare themselves for going out into uns the bat. Look, what you're witnessing for them is a safe space. My friends are here, my family here, whatever else it is. So I'm in a safe space, jousting with an opponent, and he's throwing everything he can at me. But at the end of the day, I'm in a safe space. So that when I go out into the world that's an unsafe space, there's nothing somebody else can say that can harm me, because I'm already equipped to deal with it in safe spaces. So, so, so that jousting, that insulting, whatever else it is, and I know it's problematic for folks who are outside of the culture. You have, you have to understand, that is those folks equipping, equipping themselves with a thick skin to handle the oppression and the challenges of the real world. But isn't that the same when we when we think about teachers within different generations? Of course. And we, 
the the to me we are we're being too cruel mm -hmm. and judgmental yeah. teacher to teacher of course and we cannot be successful completely in our profession we cannot keep that magic going if I'm always like look at him over there look why does he think he can wear that bow tie and that hat you know why does she think she knows what she's doing why do we do this to young teachers in the profession how can she possibly or how can he possibly know what he's doing he's only been doing this for a year two years there's it's an because intuition. people are jealous of people who exemplify something that they lack. And sometimes seasoned educators have had their passion extracted from them or robbed by them. So when they see a young person who's connecting in that way, they're just jealous because they don't have it anymore. I I'm, I'm being dead serious. And I, I always tell young folks who have this sort of like sauce and this kind of magic, don't let somebody else's critique of who you are make you become a version of them. Because the reason why they're critiquing you is because they love what you have to offer and they don't know how to get it back. So that, that idea of being hater-proof is an essential piece of this work. And people look at me all the time and make brass judgments. Like, you know, why is he wearing a hat? I get it all the time. He's working with kids. Why does he have a hat on? There's a big psychology around my wearing my hat. Like, as a man of color, as an educator, I know that historically, uh, when, when, a, when, a, when a black man enters into a room with other folks, the way to, to show your less than -ness is to take your hat off for them, mm. right? And historically, for my people, you take your hat off as a way to give a person who, you know, a white person with power, power over you. So it doesn't matter if you have a title over them. It doesn't matter if you're more informed, more educated. You take your hat off as a way to say, regardless of what happens, you have power over me. So for me, my wearing my hat is a political act to affirm my presence. Wow. Now, some folks say, well, you should take your hat off. A gentleman take their hat off. Well, where did that come from? You know, it's, you know, so, and, and I know that you know, young folks of color in, in public schools right now that don't take their hat off and them not taking their hat off leads oh. to suspension and leads to uh, special education. Okay. And it's a hat. Okay. And for I... me, you know, it has political significance. Like for all those young folks who are forced to take their, who are forced to take their hat off who don't because it's their crown. For all those young folks who wear their hat because of the way that they can affirm that their presence, I, as Professor Emden, keep my hat on. And if you don't understand the complexity of that, um, and you want to hate because of that, you know, like, like how, how, like, I, I feel sorry for you because you don't understand the depth of the urban experience. You don't understand the complexity of the black experience, and you don't have to be black or white to not understand that because there are black folks who have the same thing. You know, I always say, you know, there are black folks who suffer from. Um, you know, white supremacist ideologies, um, sometimes more than white folks do. And I think we all have to heal from those biases so we can be better for young people. So Chris, I'm now on this, I'm truly aspired to make sure every teacher knows their walk-up song. Mm. Like, you know, you need to have it in your head, even if it's not playing out loud, yeah. you need to be playing it yeah. so you own who you are, you be you, and then when you walk into the class, it, there's an energy, there's a radiance. I got two of them for you. Okay, tell me what yours are. So my first one is Everything Man by Talib Kweli. It plays in my head every time I walk to give a talk. And then my other one is When by J-Rock, okay. right? Which is just like, this, like, it's just like a victory lap kind of song. Um, and you know I what? I like I'm even watching you like- Oh man, I hear it. Like, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. When, 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 when. Mm, everything okay. else, just when, 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 when. And you know what I'll say my third one is? Um, Till This Day by Loaded Lux. Okay. Till This Day by Loaded Lux is a powerful song too. And I'm gonna start using more of SoundCloud because that's where you find a lot oh, of man. hidden gems, gems and talent and dis descriptions. And so teachers out there, if you don't have your walk-up song, if you don't have your playlist. Well, you need one. You need one. Um, Chris, it has been so amazing. Thank I you. Mean, your contribution to aspiring teachers, your contribution to middle age, Generation X, um, still finding their voice, mm. um, but most importantly, the gift that you're bringing to kids. And this, you know, I keep referring to them after learning more from, you know, do something, um, dot org. The whole thing of this Generation Z. Yeah. I, ha I, I'm raising one. Yeah. And I just find it. It just gives me breath, it gives me hope, it gives me energy. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you and I will be talking more because 
Oh, we will. We're connected um, now. Pound. What, what is it? Pound? I'm gonna do a pound. Pound. It's all love. You, you, you've earned the pound. Um, Thank you. And I, I was I waiting because I was like, I don't think I've gotten a pound. No, no, no. no. You, no, you've earned, you've earned the pound. <laughs> this has been great. Thank you for uh, for allowing me on your platform, and thank you guys so much for visiting today and for us to have this conversation and and capturing those beautiful young people. And I just gonna give some shout outs real quick. Yes, please. Hip hop bash. I want to give a shout out to my hip hop ed family. Um, every Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern on Twitter for convening and exchanging. Uh, Mill Cook, Tim Jones, Kiana Spellman, Nikki Knowledge. Uh, shout to Ebb, shout to Loaded Luck, shout to Nikki Knowledge. Uh, sh shout out to everybody who's out there who believes in the power and potential of young people. Despite what it may seem like, we will win because they will win. Thank you. Nice, thank you. Yeah. Hey everyone, thanks for listening. I always love talking with Chris. Over the past couple of years, we've become good friends and trusted colleagues, advising each other on life, education, and actually any topic that is on our heart and mind at the time. What I have realized through the gift of this friendship is the importance of having a friend and a trust circle that gives you the grace, opportunity, and allowance for brave spaces. As I reflect back on this specific conversation, I am reminded of the care Chris takes with every aspect of teaching. It is awesome to listen in on, right? I love that despite the differences between us, despite the generational gap that separates us, we are on the same wavelength when it comes to students and what we want for teachers. He and I often have a moment where we connect on a level that simply says, without verbally stating, yeah, you get it. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, your friend, Noelle. If you'd like to be a guest on the Learning Moments Teachers in America podcast, please email us at shape at hmhco.com. Be the first to hear new episodes of Learning Moments by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Please rate and review and share with your network. You can find Teachers in America on the HMH YouTube channel and read more on our Shaped blog by visiting hmhco.com backslash shaped for the transcript and key takeaways. The links are in the show notes. During this time, HMH is supporting educators and parents with free learning resources for students. You can visit hmhco.com backslash learning support for more information. Learning Moments is produced by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, The Learning Company. Thanks again for listening.